Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'd like to share with you this case of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Normally, with the history of prostate medication use, we have an idea of a patient needing intracameral epinephrine. Usually, these patients have a borderline pupil, but not always. This patient had no history of prostate medication use, and as a result, this was a little bit of a surprise. And so, I'm going to show you this case to point out one early signs of the floppy iris syndrome and then also what to do and what not to do in this case. So here I'm marking the central cornea and then making my incisions. I'm filling the eye with viscoelastic and making my triplanar corneal incision, I'm making a vertical groove and then tunneling and then entering into the anterior chamber. So far, so good. I don't see any evidence of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. I make my puncture with my capsule rexus forcep and I go ahead and make my capsule rexus in a counterclockwise manner. Again, during these maneuvers, I'm doing a very careful regrabbing of the capsule rexus, but there is absolutely no indication that the iris is floppy at this point. A little bit maybe as I'm manipulating the capsule rexus forceps, you can see that there's a little bit of a peaking to the wound. I always like to burp viscoelastic after I do my rexus, and you can see a little bit of a peaking of the pupil towards the incision. So that's the first thing. You want to be able to recognize the problem I'm not sure if I recognized it at this point, but you'll see what changes here. I perform my standard capsular fornix hydrodissection technique, and as I finish the wave and I'm about to burp the wound, I see that there is significant peaking to the wound now. And so what am I supposed to do? So well, the first thing you don't want to do is push more OVD into the eye. The reason iris comes to the wound is because the intracameral pressure is far higher than the external pressure. And so when you burp the wound, the iris just follows the path of least resistance and herniates out of the wound. And so what are you supposed to do next? You have to reduce the intracameral pressure. And so you can see I'm using the cannula to burp as much viscoelastic out of the eye, and I'm pushing as much as I can. And as I'm pushing, you can see I'm encountering iris because it continues to want to come forward. But that is the goal. I'm pushing and burping the wound as much as possible to allow as much OVD out of the eye as much as possible. So that is the first step and you don't give up. You just keep pushing and keep pushing that wound. And finally, the iris will not come to the wound anymore. So what to do next? Well, first thing you don't wanna do is push more OVD into the anterior chamber. Once you get the pupil more round, it's tempting to try to push more OVD into the eye in order to make the pupil bigger. But now you're just recreating that same problem. And every time you go into the eye with either the phaco tip or the INA tip, that iris is going to come forward again. So don't fill the eye with OVD again. Instead, what you should be doing is filling the eye with intracameral epinephrine. And so that's what you're seeing now. I'm pushing intracameral epinephrine, even though there's OVD in the eye just like painting tripan blue on the anterior capsular surface after the OVD is in. You can still paint the iris with epinephrine, even though there's OVD in the eye, and you can see that this is gonna be a much more stable iris. So just keep that in mind. Even though the eye is filled with OVD, you can go back and inject some more intracameral epinephrine and stabilize the pupil. But you wanna make sure you inject the epi right around the iris and not injecting it indiscriminately into the anterior chamber. That's the key. You're just pulsing epinephrine over the area of the iris. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start the phaco. I lift my wound with my chopper and then go in with the phaco tip and then start irrigation after that. I perform the double chop maneuver, placing the chopper out of the equator and placing the phaco tip more vertically, subincisionally and crushing the lens material in between my chopper and phaco tip. You can see that the chopping is going very easily and very nicely. I'm using a limited amount of ultrasonic energy. I'm using a significant amount of vacuum to aspirate the lens material. I'm using the chopper to kind of prolapse the lens material into the central safe zone, and I'm crushing the lens material as I go. Again, I'm pulsing in between and then crushing, crushing the lens pieces, sandwiching the lens pieces, and when the pieces are small enough, bite-sized pieces, I emulsify the lens material. This is about a one to two plus dense lens, it's not too bad. I've removed half the lens and I moved the hemonucleus in front of me and then took the chopper out to the equator and sandwiched the lens material between the chopper and the fingertip, crushing it, and then once I have 
bite-sized pieces, going ahead and emulsifying the lens. This is the last quadrant. I'm crushing again the lens material, sandwiching it, and then when the pieces are small enough, and then I'm emulsifying the lens. And so this is kind of the last fragment that I'm encountering here. This, again, the CDE is fairly low, fairly routine case, crushing this last part of the endonucleus that's left. I'm making sure the chopper is deep between the posterior capsule and the phago tip. Once I'm done with all the endonucleus, it's safe to go ahead and aspirate and vacuum out the epinucleus. You can't really aspirate the endonucleus when it's big, but the epinucleus collapses into the port very easily. So then I switch to the INA and I'm performing my standard INA technique. I start subincisionally and then work my way around. You can see that the machine just does a really nice job in removing all that material fairly efficiently. I'm going ahead and polishing the anterior capsular rim of the lens epithelial cells, and then I'm going and polishing the posterior capsule as well. I like to do this and feel confident with it due to this polymer tip, which is really a game changer as far as I'm concerned with regards to INA. I don't think I remember the last time I had any complications doing INA with this polymer tip. I'm flushing with BSS into the, the subincisional capsular fornix to remove any remaining cortical material. Normally I push BSS through the paracentesis to maintain the anterior chamber, and I also come out even with the fluid on, but this was my mistake. So number four, don't come out with the phaco tip or the INA tip with the irrigation on. As you can see, as you're creating that high intracameral pressure with the irrigation, as soon as you come out, that iris is gonna come right out with it. And so I did make that mistake here, but so thankfully I was able to go right back in and reposit that iris without it coming out too much. And then I fill the eye with OVD and start polishing the anterior capsular surface on the left side and then the right side after that. So I go ahead and inject the IOL and then I'm cleaning out the rest of the viscoelastic here. And so this is the final step and hopefully I practice what I preach and so this is the final step of removing the INA handpiece before hydrating my incisions. I make sure that I stop irrigation and I gently come out of the eye with the INA handpiece and I'm decompressing the anterior chamber, trying to equilibrate that intracameral pressure to the external pressure. And as I do so, the iris does not come to the wound and then I'm able to hydrate my incisions. And because of these movements and because I had a good size incision where I wasn't having too much fluid aggress. I was able to do this case fairly uneventfully without a lot of iris to the wound. You can see that the iris has not been traumatized too much and this is the end of the case. So I hope this was helpful to you and thank you for your attention.